You are now watching Believe. Do you believe? Welcome back. Welcome back to An Athlete's Journey. I'm your host, Travis Reed on the Believe Network. Today, everybody, I have a special, special guest of mine, a friend I've been knowing since I was about 13, 14 years old. Yeah, man. And we've been playing with each other since we was, like I said, little kids. He's yeah. Another one of those California legends that uh that uh people be sleeping on. Like I said, it, people don't realize this dude literally was the one-on-one champ in California, which is imagine how many dudes play one-on-one. He was the one-on-one champ. I watched him play in the one-on-one world championships of 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 uh one-on-one, which I ain't never heard of until I saw him. <laughs> this is my boy Aaron Maxey. You know, he's he's still hooping people. He's still hooping. He's like 40, 42, 43 years 43. old. That's what I said. Yeah. And he's, he's been playing for 20 some years professionally. So I give him the much props. I retired 10 years ago <laughs> and he's still hooping. You know what I'm saying? So I give him much love, much respect. Um, Aaron, thank you for coming on the show, my brother. Nah, Travis, it's, it's a pleasure to you know be on, and uh, you know just like you said, you know we've been playing together since the beginning of our careers. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember, I actually remember our first time, you know, playing. It would have been um, we were about 13, 14 when you were playing with Ark, yeah, with ARC, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it was like uh, you <laughs> with uh, Jared and Jason. Yep, 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 and, yep. Uh, I want to say you guys also had. Uh, uh, Eric Murdoch, I think it was. That was no, James Murdoch. James yeah, Murdoch on, yeah. on your team. Mm-hmm, yeah, you guys had James mm-hmm. Murdoch. Yeah, yeah well, so we, yeah. we had it. We, we, that squad was, you know, we went to the Nationals. Right. And lost in the championship game. Uh, yeah. That was like in the final. So, yeah, I remember that. That team, you know, we went to the final final four two years in a row in the Nationals. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, you know, we, you know, we've been, you know, just, you know, friends, teammates, you know, opponents, you know, for, for literally 30 years, you know, but the, the brotherhood that's there, you know, it's just awesome. And it's great to, you know, be able to come on, on your show and, you know, be able to chop it up for a minute. Oh, no, definitely, man. I was like, um, you know, I knew that you were still playing. I just didn't know where. And then like, now that I, when I hit him, when I hit you up, I was like, he was like, oh yeah, man, I definitely, let's link up soon. And I was like, all right, boom, bet. Because, right. you know, and like I said, uh, Aaron and people was just like, you don't understand, like, he's one of those, you know, they did so much with his career, left California, wasn't one of, you know, went to Providence, but we'll get into that, mm-hmm. um, you know, a little bit later, but just became just a great European player, great artist, uh, uh, I was going to say uh, Spanish player, you know, mm-hmm. you know, Central America, there we go. I can't think of the word. Right. Yeah. The Central America play. I, I played in Bogota, Colombia for one season. Okay. He played, you know, obviously a bunch of years in Portugal and all, you know, Argentina and all these other yeah. places. You know, the, you know, we're getting all that his story. Yeah. So, but let's just start it off, Aaron. Uh, how did your basketball journey start? My my st- journey started. Um, my mom actually gave me a push in the plane. So okay, okay. we had a sixth grade tournament. Um and it was just a one day thing and went ahead and played. And I think uh, our school, I think we took second place, but that was actually the first team that I played on. So I was 12 and um, you know, the, the following year, you know, get getting ready to go into kind of junior high, seventh grade early. My mom had asked if I wanted to play. I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and play. You know, it was fun, you know, last year. So, you know, she realized, you know, that, you know, the, the local, you know, Elsinore league, you know, she, she felt like I was better than that, but I needed something to be challenged. You know, needed some mm-hmm. kids who were, you know, my size. So I actually started playing NJB all net. Mm. And um, and NJB was always a part of my family, um, you know, with Dennis Murphy, um, because my older brother, he actually played the very first year that NJB was going on. So it was in mm-hmm. Anaheim. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mom was actually pregnant with my little brother. So, I mean, oh, literally wow. NJB being a part, you know, of the family, you know, we all played. And, uh, you know, we became, you know, good friends with Dennis Murphy and just mm-hmm. the upbringing of, of NJB. But, um, you know, I played an all net with uh, the Riverside team. So we drive from Lake Elsinore and, you know, went ahead, tried out, make, made the little team. And, you know, I would, uh, you know, go ahead and play on Sundays mm-hmm. for the all net. But, um, you know, just to kind of work on, you know, my skills, my mom actually, my mom and dad put me in the uh, Elsinore League. So Saturdays was kind of practice for me, you know, kind of work on my stuff. 
-hmm. And then Sundays was really like the real game. So that's where, you know, everything got started. Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah, look, people that drive from Lake Elsinore down to Anaheim, whoo, you know what I'm saying? Right. Right. I know that drive. I know that drive. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So for you to do that, it was show commitment from the start. So were you interested in playing any other sports? I actually grew up, uh, my first love is uh, baseball. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, I played baseball for a bunch of years. I still have my bats and baseballs. Um, actually, when I started playing in, in the seventh grade, I was still playing, making all star teams, you know, playing baseball. And, um, you know, we went to, uh, we went to district. And I think, I want to say that was the end of seventh grade going into eighth grade. We had made district. Okay. Um, and we, we got smoked. We ended up playing the team. <laughs> we got smoked in district. But, you know, but for for that time, that was a big deal with the uh, the team from Elsinore being able to go that far. We won um, our section down on Oceanside. We mm-hmm. beat a you know, handful of San Diego teams, got to uh, the next round. And, you know, there's a couple teams from Victorville, San Bernardino, a couple other squads. And, you know, we ended up getting smoked. But, you know, it was a good time, you know, playing everything else. But, um, you know, during that time, I was just falling more and more in love with hoops. And so I just made that transition from playing baseball to, you know, playing hoops. And I still go to the batting cage and hit and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, that's just what it was. It was just, you know, something about, you know, playing the competition. Um, it was a faster paced game. And that's what you know, I decided to do. Um, and I also played soccer. Mm, okay. I played soccer for a bunch of years. I played soccer for about seven years, seven, eight years, you know, as well. So okay. basketball was kind of the last thing I picked up, but I played in my neighborhood. Um, when we moved from Anaheim to Lake Elsinore, um, you know, then I was in a regular neighborhood. We had sidewalks, stuff like that. And it was just regular, you know, neighborhood antics. You know, you play with the kids in the neighborhood, hoop at my house, go down to, you know, my buddy Danny's house. You know, he was like mm-hmm. five, six, six houses down the street. We hoop at his house sometimes, go a couple streets over, you know, in the, uh, you know, subdivision. And everything mm-hmm. was cool. But, um, you know, that's where, you know, it really all got started. All right. No, that makes sense, man. I tell you, the love of the game starts at a young pace and you just kind of hoop in and then everything else comes in, you know. Right. So you must have rapidly, you know, got better because I remember the fact that if you just kind of started sixth, seventh grade and you were already doing AAU basketball, that means you must have really made a jump from just yeah. neighborhood good to like really, really good. Well, as you know, when we were playing AAU, you know, there's a lot of fundamentals still being taught. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it wasn't just roll out the balls and, you know, you're just athletic and you just do whatever. You know, so there was still a lot of skill uh, being taught. And actually, uh, you know, Ron Baldwin. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. So, so Ron's dad was actually our assistant coach. And, you know, oh. he played a little pro-am ball back in the day, you know, as well. So, you know, he really helped us out. And just with, for myself, playing with just different kids at different in places, I was starting to, you know, add things to my bag. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, mm-hmm. you know, I'm playing against, you know, Travis this time, you know, Travis does a little something. Okay, I, I like what he's doing. You know, might have played against, you know, uh, Kenny and Barron when they were on K-Swiss with that, mm-hmm. you know, seeing how they're playing. You know, so that's where everything was starting to really, you know, fall into place. So a- as I, you know, train kids now at that age of 12, 13, 14, 15, it's not a gradual increase. It's more peaks and valleys in terms mm-hmm. of being able to put things mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. Um and I think that with playing soccer with the footwork, yeah. that really helped me out. And then the, the eye-hand coordination of baseball, that added to it as well. So I think between the two sports and, of course, you know, just playing in the na- neighborhood, you know, it really helped me, you know, expand and really grow rapidly. Okay. So when you went to high school, obviously you, you're playing AU, you, you're playing with, you know, I, I, and I've told many people this, I think 97, is, this class is stupid. It's right. probably the best class in California history, and this is my opinion, right? Because obviously we at the top with with with, with Shea, mm-hmm. Aaron, Burgess, Collins twins, right? You know, and along with me, you, Kenny Bruner, Kevin Bradley, right. Kevin Augustine, Greg Lake, right? Billy Knight, Jamal mm-hmm. Mosley, and I always felt like um, ninety seven, you know, Mike McDonald, right? Just like so many Jeff Trapange, <laughs> it's like, yeah. The, yeah, the list is like beyond crazy man right and so i always felt like you know like playing against each other growing up we were rapidly just better at a younger age Mm -hmm. and 
you know, as far as going into high school, um, we already, all of us had names from playing right. against each other. And right. so if my question for you is being probably the top guy in your area, what made you go to the school that you went to instead of maybe going to Riverside North or JW North or something like that? I didn't drive. I was 14. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the truth is, you know, my dad actually worked in Redlands. Okay. And, and so he would actually pass, you know, north, you know, on the way to work because he was off of, um, you know, the 90, where the 91 and the 215 kind of hit right there at the 60, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's 91, 215, where the 91 kind of ends. Um, so that's where he is working. But, yeah, you know, I looked at it as, you know, if I keep working on my craft, they'll find me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, and as, as we know, you know, there's a, a handful of guys out of the IE, you know, between San Bernardino, Riverside, you know, who were able to, you know, get to, you know, a school. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, you know, we, we already had established names going into high school, even though we were all 14, we all had that smoke that, you know, we weren't playing in just the 14 and other stuff. You know, we were playing slam and jam playing in the 17 and under playing against, like the um, uh, Tra um, um, Travon Carmichael's mm -hmm. and the Perquan mm -hmm. Jacobs, you know, mm -hmm. those guys. And th those were our OGs, you mm -hmm. know, even mm -hmm. with Jelani, you know, um, Gardner and, and Trey Folks and all those guys, you know, those were the guys who were our big homies, but we knew we had to step our game up to be able to play with them, you know, mm -hmm. even, you know, Chris Johnson, mm -hmm. you know, company. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so those were our older guys, but our peers were, were us. You know, and then we also had, you know, the class ahead of us. So it was Shay and, you know, Jay Hart and, you know, Corey Benjamin and, you know, mm -hmm. all those guys. So th those are our peers mm -hmm. who are just mm -hmm. a year ahead. And then a year behind, you know, we had, you know, Tay Sean and company as well. So, you know, even though, you know, we had those kind of three years, we kind of had that four year, five year, you know, group mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, you know, we knew what, what it took. We knew who was established. Mm -hmm. You know, we knew mm -hmm. what what we needed to do. So even though I was out in Lake Elsinore, I was going to Temesco Canyon, it was brand new, you know, because literally my freshman year was the first year they had varsity. Oh, wow. You know, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 90, 93, 94 was the first varsity season. So I knew at the end of the day, I just got to play hard, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, just keep my mouth shut, play hard and get it where I fit in. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that that was kind of the, the mindset with all of us because I don't really – remember any of us really talking a whole bunch of just junk you know to one another. we just all played hard mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and I think that's what you know really just worked because I knew you know I could look to try to you know drive to you know a north or try to commute to a modern day or you know something like that but you know was it really worth it because that's going to take away just from you know just being a kid no no definitely I, I feel like you know a lot of times we're like we're shipped or bus to another place where you're like an hour away from school, 45 mm -hmm. minutes away from school. And you're like, Oh, I'm going to stay. My address is my auntie's house. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's right. in the, it's in the territory. Um, but no, I, trust me, that, that's how it was when I went to Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily live in the district right. uh, of Crenshaw, but like I was going to Crenshaw my ninth grade year. I was living yeah. in another city's district, but like, you know, wanted to go to that, top tier mm -hmm. school or whatever the case is. Right. You know, obviously you being one of the top players in the country uh, in high school, and we, and folks, just a little sidebar story. Me and Aaron played together a lot. Uh, we actually played together in what the biggest tournament of the summer, which is the NIT mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in, in, Los, in uh, Long Beach. Yeah. And we actually won the whole thing. You know, we, we would have yeah. won it. You know, we, right. beat, we was one of the few teams to uh, be Elton Brand and, well, yeah. Yeah, and brought our test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have two losses in three years, and one of them was to us. Yeah. So I, that's one of my big things. I remember that like it was nothing. Like, right. The other New York team beat Shea and them, and they thought it was going to yeah. be in New York, New York. And I was like, not, not, a, not, a, not, not this time. We beat them. You know what I'm right. saying? Um, what would you say your most memorable moment in, in high school was? You know, I think, you know, that that was a memorable moment. And the funny story about that, there's the second part of that story. Mm -hmm. So we would have played Kareem Shabazz and Lamar Odom. Yep. 
Mm-hmm. So Kareem's actually one of my best friends because he played with me at Providence. Okay, okay, okay. And so I, and if you remember, let's set the stage. We're sitting there, 49er gym, Long Beach State. Mm-hmm. It's about 100 degrees. <laughs> no joke. It's yeah. roasted in there. It is. And, it the, is. and the, Long, the Long Island Panthers come walking in with, with their hoodies on, walking around the court. And you see Kareem, you see Lamar. You know, the rest of their crew, we were just like, what in the world are they thinking? Because they're about to pass out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm talking to, to Baz about it. And Baz said, yeah, you know what? We're going to play. But for whatever the reason, because we went to Vegas right after we did the NIT. But they had that first round game. So they had the lead. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm, that's why they didn't mm-hmm. play you know, in the finals against us, which I think would have been a great finals with, with our team. No, oh, no, man. I was I was thinking like, you know, Khalid, because I think Khalid Alameen was on that team yeah. too. Yeah. And and I was like, man, I would have loved to see Khalid versus Baron. Right. You know, Kareem Shabazz versus Jay, you know, Jay, because we had Jaron on our team. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, just and everybody else in between. Right. You know, because we only played like seven guys, but we had like seven, yeah. like, you know, seven monsters on our team. Right. Right. You know, and so we we uh, we thought like we slayed the beast when we beat El right. Brand and run our test. So right. the the new or like their team, oh, we would have. I felt like we would have smacked them. We just I beat think, the best think, team, exactly, because they also had Eric Barkley. Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Like I said, that was you know the Riverside team was stupid, and we beat them. I was like, we about to we about to right. win this whole thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I mean, you know that that was cool. Um, and I I like. You know, and I also liked being able to go to Adidas All America camp and also going to Nike. Mm-hmm. You know, and, mm-hmm. the, and the mm-hmm. two experiences were were very, very different. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, at Adidas, I met Rock Lloyd. Oh, you know, so that that's, was the first yeah. time I met, <laughs> that's my boy. Know, that's yeah, that's the homie. You know, so that was the first time I met Rock, and you know, he was you know the beast coming out of you know New York. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so it gave me you know a real a real time opportunity to play against a lot of these guys that we were just reading about between street and Smith and, yeah. you know, blue chip magazine at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was really cool. Cause I, I also played against Kobe's team. Okay. So, so that's okay. the first time, you know, going up against Kobe and you know, all the hype and Lester Earl was there. Um, trying to think who else, there's a couple other, you know, big names that were there at the time. Uh, Tim Thomas was there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was cool to be able to do that. And then going to Nike the next year and seeing just the difference with that, you know, and hooping with, you know, just the different teams, you know, so, I mean, it was, those were great experiences. What um, would you, uh, what would you say the biggest difference between the Adidas and the Nike camp, you know, in your opinion, since you went to both? In, in my opinion, you are actually able to have better friendships off the court at Adidas because it was less, it was less um, structured in terms of if you weren't playing, you had to practice. If you weren't practicing, you were forced to, to sit. You know, with that, it was, you know, we were roommates. We played on different teams and you were playing the six o'clock game. I had the seven o'clock, you know, we could go ahead and watch if we want to go to the lounge and just chill. You know, you can go to the lounge and you're just, you know, mucking it up with, you know, whoever. That's how I met, um, you know, Zach Marbury. Okay. Okay. You know, and, okay. you know, been cool with Zach, you know, since then. So, you know, it was just having those opportunities to be able to cross paths and speak to people and actually, you know, get to know one another. Where at Nike, as you know, you know, we basically just kind of stayed with our group. Yeah. You know, yeah, with everything that we yeah, did. Yeah, you know, yeah. So that took away, I felt that it took away the enjoyment of being able to actually watch different people and just being able to meet. And, you know, who knows, this might be my teammate, you know, next season. No, no, you're right. I think when Nike it was like, you know, 11 to 12, this practice. One to two games, two to three games, you know, then practice or what? Like it was like, right. then, then you know, like dinner or then like talking and right. The whole day was just like camp. It was, it was like boot camp. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly how I referred to it as you know being more of a boot camp rather than it's an exposure camp. You know, we already know because you know we we enjoy playing in the punk stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, yep, the punk yep. stuff was dope. You know, I, I was actually with the punks um about a year ago because they were out here. You know, so I mm-hmm. caught up with them. You know, good to see them. And you know, we all know you know the punks as as royalty as they know everybody. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. You know, but um, you know, just being able to have that access, I, I loved those camp settings mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it really allowed us to to jockey for a position, mm-hmm. figure out you know where we stack up, you know, in comparison. 
Um, you know, we always knew it was based off of somebody's, you know, opinion, but you knew who really had that smoke and who did it, you know, who, who you got that day or, you know, you might have, you know, got them all week. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So you knew what it was, mm-hmm. you know, so that, that was, I felt like those were really great opportunities. And then of course, you know, just playing, you know, I always love playing in the NIT and playing in, you know, the Easter classic. You know, those were always, you know, just fun tournaments. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely agree with you on that. I feel like, you know, like you talked about with Nike camp, it was a chance to see like the greats, you know, because I remember it was the year before you came because you, you came senior year. Right. But junior year, I saw Ronnie Fields. Okay. Um, I First time I saw Mike Bibby. I played with mm-hmm. Mike Bibby, who was on the team. We won the whole thing, mm-hmm. the California team. Uh, you know, you, you get to see it, and like the, even the counselors that were there, right? Like we, we got a chance to see Tim Duncan; he was a counselor. Right. Uh, you know, Vince Carter. Yeah. You know, uh, the the big homie Keith yeah. Cross was a counselor. Yeah, yeah, he was. He was there. Uh, who else? Uh, Antoine Walker was there. Like yeah. they they was playing pickup. Right at night you know, after at night, they kind of sent us. You know, yeah, to bed. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they was playing pickup sometimes. You know, we would try to sneak down and watch a game right. or something like that. Um, but yeah, man, like it was, you know, Nike camp was insane. And like I said, I remember that. People don't realize, like when I was at Nike camp, I had Aaron, I, I, I told him to hold my shoes for 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 a night so we could I could put it in my put in my bag next day so we could roll out with the Nike shoes because they were trying to take them back. I'm like, what are you well, going to just destroy but them? They, but they actually gave us the shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they turned around and, you know, we had our choice of, you know, the, the low-top Jordans or uh, I forget what the white and black shoes were, but, you yeah. know, we had the choice of either or. Um, I actually took the the white and black shoes because the straps that had the Nike All-American on them, mm-hmm. you know, I was able mm-hmm. to keep that. I know, I know, um, you know, I got the straps at my parents' house still, mm-hmm. you know, just as far as, like, certain memorabilia. Of course, so, of course, of course. Yeah. All right. All right. So you're one of the top players in the state of California, basically one of the top players in the country. Um, you ha- you're getting recruited by a lot of schools, right? Mm-hmm. What was your recruiting experience like and why did you choose the school that you chose? So I was actually looking, I was actually going to uh, go to SC mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Charlie Parker was there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was all set, ready to go, you know, to SC. And then when Charlie lost his job, you know, it was a whole lot of gray area. I just didn't feel comfortable with it. So, you know, I went ahead and just, uh, you know, left. The, and uh, I actually was, I committed to go to uh, Pepperdine with Romar. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I was all set, ready to go there. They ended up having uh, a bit of a fight. Some guys got thrown out of school. So he let me out of the commitment. And I, at that point, I was just like, well, I think I'm just going to go East Coast. Okay. Um, you know, Notre Dame had been coming out, you know, every year since freshman year of high school, you know, checking mm-hmm. me out. Um, Pittsburgh was on me heavy and uh, Providence was, you know, as well. And there was a handful of uh, schools from the WAC conference at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, you know, even with UCLA, you know, Herrick had, you know, reached out, you know, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I was just like, you know, I'm just going to do something different. So, um, you know, I, I know um, the coach at the time at, um, at Notre Dame, I think he had gotten sick because they just kind of fell off the map. And actually, one of my best friends played for ND when we were in school. And he was like, why didn't you come? You're like, they said you were coming. I'm like, I didn't hear from coach. He's like, coach got sick. I'm like, nobody told me, you know, any of that stuff. So, right, 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 right. And Pittsburgh came in, um, you know, before Providence. And I just, you know, I just kind of had a weird vibe, you know, with, with Pittsburgh. It just wasn't clicking and then you know with providence i was just like you know what i know you know austin yeah i worked out with austin a couple of times it's like you know what i'll just go there and then i also knew Derek brown okay, okay. Um, and Derek okay. brown he had played against my older brother juco you know stuff so i was like you know what they're both there you know i'm just gonna give it a shot so that's really how you know, i ended up out, out there okay okay what do you remember about your first year in college you know what playing out of position <laughs> playing power forward and center, guarding guard and footers and guys who outweigh me by, you know, 50 to 80 pounds on a, <laughs> a daily night. But, um, you know, it, it was it was that and then just really figuring out how things were going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our our two go-to guys were uh, Jamel Thomas, Sebastian Telfair's brother, 
and then also uh, Kendrick Moore, you know, out of Connecticut, out of Hartford. And so, you know, there was, um, you know, those two up top and then everybody else kind of got in where they fit in. So it's just about, you know, just really just figuring out, you know, how am I going to score? You know, how am I going to, you know, be an asset? You know, I knew I could play D, mm-hmm. you know, so would, you know, get defensive rebounds, you know, fill the lane, you know, and one of the things that, you know, we both know from playing with BD and, and Kenny, if you fill the lane, they're going to hit you, you know, so that's, you know, that's why I really started, you know, being able to just, you know, make my money. So it was like, if I got a footer, he's trying to guard me, I'm going to outrun him all day. And so that's what had me, you know, effective. Um, and in the grand scheme of things that hurt me in terms of leaving school, because I'd come home and play to say no, play, you know, play the two, play the three, you know, ball out. But then I go back to school. Yeah, that's great. We saw what you did, but you need to play power four. Six. Like, Yo, I'm six, six. You know? So, and it didn't help in terms of, you know, moving on. And as you know, you got to have, you know, people really advocating for you you know, the mm-hmm. right way of, of, to be able to get that shot. And, uh, you know, I know Sean Marion and Sean Marion had Mark Dickle and, and Sparky. He loves to just go ahead and pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, that really worked out, you know, for Sean, you know, again, being an undersized, you know, power forward, you know, that type of situation. Mm-hmm. But you know, I didn't have that same type of, um, you know, my last two years, I didn't have that same type of uh, point guard you know, who was looking up, you know, really looking to feed, you know, pass like that. So no, of course, you know, it, of course. Was, it was what it was. Every point guard's different, you know, as we know, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, so, you know, that just wasn't the situation with the offense, you know, so just went ahead, did what, did what I could and, you know, just kept it moving. Well, I got you. I got you. What would you say is your greatest triumph and your greatest failure in college? I think the greatest triumph was uh, being a player of the game in the, in the uh, NCAA tournament. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest failure is should have went to another school. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, keep it, I'll keep it 100. Not, not, not because it wasn't a good school or anything like that. Right. But I say that because every school that recruited, and I'm sure it was the same thing for you, mm-hmm. all the coaches left. And it was mm-hmm. just that that time period. You know, even like at UCLA, you know, I'm playing you know, one of my first games in Herrick's at Rhode Island. Right. Ah, you know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, so everybody, you know, had left. Even Pete Gillen, he was there the freshman year, then he, he left, went to Virginia. So for me, I think that if I went to another school, number one, I would have been able to actually play the three rather than being stuck at the four or five. And I would have been able to play more of, you know, just the natural position of being able to play inside and out. Uh, versus, you know, just being, you know, inside because I, I would play strong and, and go hard in the paint. So that that's the only reason why I say that. No, I understand yeah. that. I but, think that um, you know, the weird thing about, you know, coaching and like college and things like that, I feel like a lot of coaches are coaching for their job every year. Right. And so like they put you in the best position to help them win, right. maybe more than helping you succeed as an individual. Mm-hmm. You know, where maybe other yeah. situations they look for you to succeed as an individual in the midst of the team right. winning. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I always yeah. felt like, yeah, you know, like that was kind of one of the things I felt like UCLA where it's like, you know, like they wanted me to be like a, a banger, you know, like mm-hmm. kind of like banger, foul out in 10 minutes kind of guy. Right. And that was just never my game. I was never that right. kind of, I was never that kind of player, you know, so. Right. For me, when I left and went to Long Beach State, it was more because I felt like, you know, like at least Long Beach should let me play my game and I yeah. can just play and just not have to worry about other stuff, you know? Right. Trying to play a particular role that wasn't your strength. Yes. And, yeah. and, and, you, and you said it perfectly. Coaches coaching for their job. Yes. Rather than coaching for success, where if I put everybody at their strengths, then I'm still going to have success. Mm-hmm. But through insecurity, mm-hmm. insecurity is going to you know, have people do certain things for their own you know, personal benefit. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's exactly what it is, you know, and that's where, you know, you went ahead, you left because they just wanted you to be a banger, foul out 10 minutes versus being able to actually just play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so, I mean, that's how I felt, you know, maybe right. they might say something different nowadays, but, you know, like I felt like at that time, there was, you know, like that's what they wanted. Right. You know, you know, uh, me to, to, to do kind of thing. And I just wasn't happy with my role. You right. Know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So 
what would you be, what would you say, you know, the biggest lesson that you learned in college? The biggest lesson is uh, being able to really be a chameleon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, being able to adapt to any situation. And that that's both on and off the court. You know, being able to mix with, you know, whatever the demographic is, whether it's, you know, low income, whether it's super rich, because I, I went to a private Catholic school where, you know, we had, you know, the Range Rovers and, you know, the hard top convertible BMWs and all that kind of stuff that was there. And then you had the kids where mom and dad both worked, you know, and, you know, just basic, you know, middle class, you know, or lower middle class, you know, situation. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all, you know, eat, we all do, you know, the same things and, you know, we go to school, study and, you know, keep moving. So that, that was probably the biggest thing is just really being able to just continue to treat everybody equally. Yeah. I, I, you know, and as you know, growing up in SoCal, you know, we don't see color because we see everybody. That's very true. That's very true. You know, that's a hundred percent very true, my friend. Like I think with us is like, we're a melting pot. So I feel like it gets you ready for the world because right. uh, that's what the world is, is a melting pot. It's not one, one, whatever, whatever. Right. It's like all together. Exactly. We all in this gumbo. <laughs> exactly. And, that, and that's exactly what it is. I mean, as, as we know with, with our, our DJ Theo from 92.3, the beat with no color lines. <laughs> yep. You know, yep, and, yep. and that's exactly, you know, what, what it is. No, agree. So uh, you are, you were all uh big East, right? At, 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 no, at, I never, I never was all big East. Um, I missed it my senior. I don't know how I missed it, but um, you know, I was all, uh, they had NAB, NABC, I think it was, which mm-hmm. was like the Northeast. So I was first team that, um, you know, my last two years of school, mm-hmm. um, you know, I was, you know, I know I was uh, preseason first team, Big East, all Big East, you know, my senior year, all that stuff. So, you know, things happen, you know, but, um, you know, still had a lot of success, you know, with it. And, okay. um, you know, we were able to uh, get to, you know, the NCAA tournament with NIT my sophomore year, NCAA senior year. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. I remember y'all made the tournament your senior year. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah. I was hyped for you, man. I was happy because I know, it, you know, I know how much it took to, you know, how it takes right. to get there, you know what I'm saying? So I get it. Yeah. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, I mean, that, and playing in both, it, it's, it's night and day. Mm. It's almost like watching the Wizard of Oz when they go from black and white to color. <laughs> because when, when, you, when you play in NIT, you just, you know, regular commercial flight, you just go, it's just like a regular game. NCAA, you got the private jet. It's just, you know, it's you, the roadies, the band, and, you know, you fly in. This is, you know, and as we know, pre 9 11, you know, you just take the bus straight to the tarmac, get on, and you're riding. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm, you know, so that was, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of fun and just a good experience to, you know, have that go on. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> All right. So you, you have four great years at Providence. Mm-hmm. Um, how was your journey after school? Did you go to like NBA camps or, you know, how did that work? How did you get to where you got to your professional career? So I ended up not going to any camps or anything like that. I'd be, uh, have my knee scoped out. Uh, so, okay. okay. So I had have my first of four meniscal surgeries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so when I had, you know, had that done and, um, really I just hooked up with an agent. He had, uh, some gigs down in Argentina. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I actually went down to Argentina, uh, went down, uh, this is actually right before Thanksgiving of 01 went down. They were in the midst of an economic collapse for the country. They weren't able to pay yeah. anybody. So I was down there for, about a month and a half, I was like, yo, since you guys can't pay, I got to roll. So, <laughs> yeah, so came back, uh, played in the USBL, played for uh, Daryl Dawkins. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, the okay. US with the uh, um, Allentown Valley Dogs, which was crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually played with um, Ronnie Fields. Okay. So okay. I got to meet Ronnie, you know, and, uh, you know, hoop with him a little bit. And, you know, I was there. You know, for a minute, they just had a revolving door, you know, just I think they ended up having probably about 25 guys before I went ahead and left. And I didn't leave because of playing. I left because they couldn't pay us. So they only they only had X amount of money. And so it was I'm trying to beat you to the teller at the bank to try to get my (laughs) check. If not, it was going to bounce and then you're not going to be paid. So I'm like, you know, I can't live live this way. And um so I ended up coming home 
and I ended up finding out about the battlegrounds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so they were playing the five on five and I had missed the five on five when I got back, but they, you know, I was able to get into a one-on-one. -on -one, so I ended up winning, you know, that first, you know, tournament, which they had the one in LA and then they had the one in New York. And then the following year, um, oh, 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 three, this is oh, two, oh, three, that following year, then they had the one that was on MTV that had the video and all that kind of stuff. So I ended up winning the national championship, you know, with that, um, Nothing came from it, which was disappointing. You know, I ended up getting sponsorship with Nike. I was with Nike for a few years, um, you know, which was cool. But in terms of getting looks or anything like that, I played in the in the D League, you know, that mm -hmm. following year, and uh, in ball, you know, and didn't get the call up or anything like that, which was disappointing. Uh, you know, played for uh, for Jeff Malone, and main reason was we stayed in last place. You know, we had mm -hmm. I played with uh, Kevin Live. Okay. Okay. Um, played from with, Temple, uh, huh? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 He played. He yeah. took over for me in, in Estonia. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so Big K Live was on my team. We had uh, Terrence Morris, who played at uh, Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. I remember Terrence yeah. Morris. I remember him. Yeah. So, you know, he's my roommate. So, the five of us, we had two other guys, uh, Derek Zimmerman, who was at Mich uh, Mississippi State. I, we I, had, uh, sounds familiar. Yeah. Uh, Zim was Zim's two years. Yeah, he's like two years behind us. Mm -hmm. He's two or three, because I think he left early. Uh, he was just super hyper athletic little guard. And uh, we had Courtney James, who he played at uh, Minnesota for a minute. Okay, okay. So that, okay. that was the five guys who stayed. The other five is just a revolving door every <laughs> week. So by the time we'd sub <laughs> out, they, you know, we might be up four, might be up five, be down four or five, still in it. The subs come in. Next thing, we're down twenty. <laughs> it was just, it was like that the whole season. So it was just a long, long season. No, but, uh, I hear you on that, man. Yeah, yeah. I would say my last year in Germany, we was, we had to, we was, we had to fight to stay in the in the second division. You know, like yeah. so we had to play another yeah, the team. Yeah. We had to play like we, they called it the the showdown for the lowdown. Okay. You know, like this, we, yeah, we played the like relegation the, game. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had to yep. fight to stay in the league. Yeah, I remember that. So we won, and our fans celebrated like we won the championship. I was right. Crying. They was pouring drinks on the coach. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Did we win the championship, or we just stay right. in the league?" I think the fans right. so happy they get to stay in the league. So yeah. that was. I remember that my last year in Germany. That was hilarious. Okay. Yeah, because um, I played in Europe when I was at Europe. Web, they brought me in. Um, one team brought me in to keep them up in the top league. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I played in the relegation. Their relegation tournament was um, the last, what was it, the last six? It's like the last six teams in the league have to battle it out. Mm -hmm. So you end up playing, um, you end up playing like six games, you know, and the, whoever has the, the top three teams would, would stay. And then I think the bottom two, then they end up playing another game to see who would go ahead and, you know, stay up or, or drop out. I got so, wow. Uh, wow. Yes. Okay. So, okay. so, you know, if you're brought in for that, they actually pay, would pay you a lot of money to go ahead and, you know, do what you got to do to keep them up. You're basically just a, a problem solver. It's <laughs> really what, what it was. Okay. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, played it in the D league, you know, did that, um, you know, made honorable mention with it, which, you know, which was cool. And then, um, you know, after that, I was like, okay, you know, I need to start, you know, really get some bread. You know, so at the time, D-League really wasn't paying, you know, much of anything. I was yeah. living off of battleground money, um, you know, Finland money, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you know, I got to start, you know, kind of making my way. So, you know, from there, you know, I bounced over to Hungary. Um, actually, I sat out that next year because I uh, ended up having my knee scoped again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went ahead and got taken out, in, like, literally, like, the last game, two games before the last game of D-League season had somebody take me out. So oh, that's what did it. Yeah. 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 So, you know, so I was out that next season, then went to Hungary, you know, played and then really started, you know, getting into that groove of going places. So I played in Hungary. This is 05, 06. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then um, after that, you know, went down to Argentina, played in Argentina for about three years. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, when I was in Argentina 2009, I actually had my first bout of Crohn's disease. So I had a big surgery down there. And, uh, you know, I was just told it was an intestinal infection. And so for the next five years, 
you know, I'm still having team physicals, all that kind of stuff, passing all of it. But there was just that thing that was just kind of lying in the background that was just kind of weird. And I wasn't able to get really any answers. But, um, you know, I went ahead, you know, left Argentina, went to Australia, played NBL, um, you know, did well down there, you know, went to, you know, New Zealand right after that, won a couple championships there, ended up over in Japan. And then, you know, at that point, I was just kind of ping ponging just seeing, you know, what the opportunities were. You know, I changed agents a few times trying to make, you know, make stuff happen. Always. And, and that's where, you know, like I said, I was just bouncing around, you know, with mm-hmm. things. No, no. I know about the change in the agents, man. I must have had about 10 of them. Like, look, right. whatever you do, just, oh, you can't do it? Okay, this guy. You can't right. do it? Okay, this guy. Okay, you can't do it? Okay, that guy. Right. You know, so it was like, I stayed loyal for an agent for a couple of years. And then I was like, man, bump this, man. Right. Like, Right. You know, like I want to do something different. I want more money. I want more yeah. something different, you know, because he, right. my agent controlled Holland because mm-hmm. he was a Dutch agent. Gotcha. And I was like, I was trying to be loyal to him because like, you know, he got me my first job, you know. Right. So, and so I was like, once he said, well, no other places want you really, but Holland has this. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? I was just like, so you're telling me no other countries want my, want my talent. <laughs> right. Hmm. Right. You know, <laughs> so I was like, yeah. let me, let me, uh, you know, let me, let me look for somebody else. I remember that. And, so. you know, and, but, but that's, that's the thing that happens that a lot of, they don't teach you. Yes. Right. And mm-hmm. even talking to, you know, the vets in the game, some of them, they're not even working with agents, you know, because they, they might've been in, in the league long enough and they've been able to command, you know, um, you know, player power. So they don't have to worry about anything. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it's usually if it was an agent, because that was my guy out of Argentina. That's why I left Argentina. Well, you know, I'm trying to get you. You ain't trying to do anything. You're just trying to keep me here because that puts money in your pocket. You know, so when I went ahead and left, I hooked up with somebody else. And in some ways, you're kind of like, hey, I'm taking a, a random chance. Right, right. You know, because I'm going into the unknown again. I don't know if this new person is going to be able to make anything happen. You know, you're sitting at home, you're working out, you're yeah. checking the email, you know, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. And then it's like finally something hits, but you just you don't know when it, that hit was going to come. Yeah, no, no. You know how it is. I mean, obviously, you did the overseas thing still, you know, still pooping. But like when the agent has something for you, he'll blow up your phone. He'll call right. you every five minutes. Right. You know, because because he wants you to sign this deal so he can get this money. Exactly. You know, but if he doesn't have a deal for you, you'll be calling him like he owe like he owe you child support. He he right. avoiding you. <laughs> right, exactly. exactly. You know what I'm saying? So then you be calling him and he'll like, hey, nothing happened, nothing yet, blah, blah, blah. And right. he's be like, ah, oh, forget it. I'm gonna just work out and focus on yeah. just doing that. But like, yeah, agents, man, like it's always funny with that. I always thought that was hilarious that right. when they had a job. Every day call when they don't have a job, you don't even know where they at. Right, exactly, exactly, and that's what I would always try to tell you. Know, some of the younger guys, you know, that's just the nature of the business. Yes, you know, you, you learn as you go. Yep, yep. So, based on your experiences, like what would be what would be your best advice for the next generation of of of, of Aaron Maxis? The, the game has changed so much. Yes, you know we we came up with the internet yep you know becoming you know being from you know just a few people having to now it's on everybody's phone you know we went from having our highlights that had to be on vhs tape or we're having to convert it from you know that to the european beta or trying to get it on dvd you know so we went through a lot of different steps and an effort just to be able to get a job Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know we knew if we sent a tape late may early june it was going to be roughly a month to six weeks before you finally heard something. No, definitely, you know, definitely. So, so the game has changed, I think. But as far as advice, work on your craft. You know, and if you're playing overseas, you're not going to be able to pat the ball for 50 dribbles. No. You're yeah. going to play within a system. Mm-hmm. You're, going to, you're going to run the system and you're going to know your role. You know, and on certain teams, you're not trying to get 30. You score your eight to 10 points, that's a good game because that's what the team needs. If they ask for more, then you'll be, the, the leash will be extended a little bit more so you can go ahead and get off a little more. Other than that, you're going to stay 
stay in your role. Um, different places you play, the style is going to be different. Mm-hmm. You know, you play in Europe, it's going to be a slow down, play the offense, play the system. You know, like we said, 60, 70 points. You're playing in Argentina, it's going to be more of your 80 to 90 points. You know, they're getting up and down the court, but they're still running systems. Um, you know, you're playing in Asia. Asia, just go ahead and get buckets. You know, that's just, you know, really what it is with some of those teams. Get buckets. If you have good coaches, it's going to be structured. But that's why you're going to be at the top because you actually got good structure. Um, you know, you play in the Caribbean, Dominican, Puerto Rico, you better be in shape because you're going to be running some hot gym and you're getting up and down and you're scoring over 100 points every game. You know, so it's going to be inflated scores. But, you know, being able to recognize you got to do your research, it's so much easier to do now. Get on YouTube. Look up leagues, see how they're playing, you know, find out about who's coaching the team. Does he run through players or is he looking to keep, you know, players around? And and all that stuff now is easy to find out. Oh, agree, agree, agree. You know, you know? And, and the biggest thing is shut up. You don't have to get the last say. Just go ahead and just do what you're told. You know. I think that's one of the biggest problems now. Everybody feels entitled to a response, entitled to an explanation. When you go overseas, it's still a dictatorship, like in college. <laughs> I can agree with that. I agree with, especially with like you know the older the older cultures who are established. Right. Uh, they want they run their system, and if you don't run their system, then you out of there. They're gonna just get the, right. other, the next American. Like, and you could be better than the next American. It won't even matter. And right. I, I can tell you so many stories where. Like my coach in Holland was cutting like all star type dudes who was mm-hmm. like all league in different countries and all domestic right. player and all this stuff. And like he didn't care. Like if you didn't run his system, right, you know, he was out. You know, he wanted dudes who ran his system. Right. As I always refer to guys, if you got the sticks and my X button ain't working, he's going to get an X that, that works. Yep. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and sub mm-hmm. in. He's going to talk to you. <laughs> Look, you're X, so I need you to do X. You're not a circle. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and that's what it is. You get your chance. You go ahead and you don't do what X does. He's just going to get somebody who doesn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so you really have to, in many ways, be humble. And you have to swallow your pride in order to keep your, keep your job. Oh, I agree. I agree. I definitely agree. Um, so, Aaron, like, how long was your overseas career tonight? Because I feel like you've been playing for over 20 years. Yeah. But how long has your career professionally been, you know, for this time? Professionally, it was, uh, I mean, really, I mean, I, I played in the uh, in the United Cup over the summer. That's what I said. You still hoop. Yeah. So, so like, yeah, I still hoop. I was MVP of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's harder now because, um, you know, people are, are looking to age players out. Of course. You know, um, and, you know, we, we've seen that even just with, within the league, guys who are still in great shape, who still perform, but they're being phased out because teams are wanting to invest in into the youth. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Where the youth can where the youth before were actually learning from the, the vets. vets. Yeah. Yeah. Because the vets still, you know, was still performing, still doing their thing. And it wasn't. Well, we're just keeping him around because he's a locker room guy. It's mm-hmm. we got him around because he knows how to play. No, you no. Know? Yeah. So, so that's the biggest difference. So, I mean, you know, now it's just kind of picking and choosing, you know, I'm basically kind of transitioning out a bit and looking at, you know, phase two of what life is, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, looking at different jobs, different, you know, situations, looking at coaching, Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at different, um, you know, companies to be able to work for, Um, again, Mm -hmm. just having the stability, right? Um, I still mm-hmm. love to get in the gym. I was just, you know, I was in the gym, you know, lifting and doing cardio before, you know, hopped on with this um, and mm-hmm. looking to play potentially in the uh, ABL, you know, for this summer, which is uh, like the Atlanta's version of Drew League. Okay. Okay. So, okay. you know, looking to play in that. And then uh, also got a, a team, the Redeem team um, that's looking to get into the uh, TBT. So, you know, I'm looking to really, you know, get myself into shape. And actually, uh, Keith Kloss, he's playing on the team as well. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So, you know, we got a handful of guys, you know, who, you know, vets, we got some young guys it's just being able to mesh it all together. Um, you know, the coach, Brian, I mean, he definitely knows his stuff. 
you know, and we also have Kevin Franklin, you know, coming in and coach. He coaches um, some UBA teams. Okay. Uh, okay. He's coached in the uh, Jones Cup over in Taiwan. So, mm-hmm. yeah, he's a seasoned coach as well. No, definitely, um, definitely. So, you know, so, I mean, looking at that, but, um, you know, truth be told, I mean, if, if the money was good, mm-hmm. then, you know, I'd go somewhere and play. And they're not trying to tell me, well, you know, you're 43 and you can't, you know, get up and down the court. I'm 43 and I still windmill. Like, <laughs> and that is true, folks. Look at his YouTube. He's done it. Trust me. You know, so it's it's one of those things where it's not about being cocky or arrogant. It's about knowing what you're capable of doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's not about, OK, well, you know, I'm trying to hang on to, you know, uh, a, a thread or something just to try to play. Mm-hmm. You know, I know if, if, you know, if I slowing down, you know, that type of stuff and just not able to play, then I'd be like, OK, you know, I, I can't play. Mm-hmm. you know now it's more so of picking and choosing where i go to play because i don't want to have somebody take me out because i don't have seven months to recover from you know an injury where you know you got to go ahead and have surgery and that kind of stuff and you know how that goes just with playing in men's leagues i play in men's leagues as well but you got to pick and choose mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. you're going to play in. no no definitely like I, for me when i play in these little leagues i just be like all right i'm gonna get up i ain't gonna jump high I ain't right. going to be trying to dunk. I'm going to just do, do a, just, you know, like right. get a sweat. I just want to get the cardio. Right. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Uh, yeah, I let the young guys, y'all do all that. I'm going to just be the old mm-hmm. wild event to just get sweat. <laughs> right. Right. And, and that's, that's exactly what it is. And, you know, like this past weekend, you know, playing in the UVA, which, you know, the UVA, they actually have a lot of guys who have played who are, you know, seasoned, you know, pros who come in, play, because they might be in between a job, they may be, you know, just staying in shape, getting ready for the next thing. But, you know, you got, got some guys that want to, you know, talk that nonsense to you. So it's like, okay, go ahead and wake me up. <laughs> go. Let's go. Right, you know? right. And then next thing you know, it's a quick 12, 15 points. And they're just like, whoa, who, who, because they, they always want to call you old school because we play efficient. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we're mm-hmm. not taking mm-hmm. five, 10, 15 dribbles. We get to our spot, knock down our shot, get to our spot. We got a mismatch, but we just doing a, a little jump hook. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do eight pump fakes and reverse pivot and a Sigma. <laughs> I don't have to do all that. I'm going right. to jump hook you to death because you can't stop me doing a jump hook to the middle left hand. Right, right. So until right, you stop right, it, I'm right, gonna, just right. going to keep doing the same thing. <laughs> I got you. That makes, it, that makes a lot of sense, man. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Well, what's the best thing uh, from your career? Like the best thing about playing overseas? You know what the best thing about playing overseas was, or just being a professional mm-hmm. is just the journey. Because mm-hmm. as you know, we went from junior high, high school, college, first one, two years of being a pro to being able to get 10 plus years as a pro, right? But being able to see everybody who really just fell in love with the game and who kept working, because like your parents were one of the few parents who would actually come to the games. Your dad would come to, to most of your games. You know, my parents would come to the games. Mm-hmm. You know, there's only a handful of us who actually had parents who would come. Um, you know, I was with Kenny Bruner in, in Melbourne back in 2016. Mm-hmm. First thing, you know, how's mom and dad? You know, you know, talking to, you know, Alex Carcamo and, you know, his, his dad had passed a few years back, but, you know, even with, you know, AC, you know, his dad was, you know, one of the few parents who'd be at the game. So we know whose parents were there, but the journey along that way, even as we started getting money, you know, our parents were still there watching us just do what we do. And mm-hmm. regardless of how, how old and how big we get, we're still their, their children. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're agreed, still little. Agreed. agreed you know, agreed, I go to agreed. my parents' house. Yeah, you know, I still got to mow the lawn. You know, <laughs> it's like, I, I got my own house. I got to mow my own lawn. Right? But you know, it, that's just what it is. You know, when you when you're a good, you know, child, you have that, and along that way, you know, we we develop this this brotherhood mm-hmm. that had mm-hmm. gone on. And like I said, you know, we we battled it as as children. We battled as you know, high schoolers, we battled as adults, you know, college mm-hmm. students, adults. And that, and that's the beauty of it because it's, it's really given us a, a bond for life. Mm-hmm. And, and our bond is, is not just what we did on the court. It's also the stuff that comes from it off the court. 
where you know time can pass and we pick up right where we left off and that's that's the thing that's the biggest takeaway you know for me because whether it's talking to you know Trey folks or talking to you know Kay Johnson or you know BD or whoever you know these are all people that we can just message and it's not a big deal mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know because th these are our peers mm -hmm. you know and nobody is too big time or anything like that to talk to anybody because we've got real, real history together. You know, and that's, that's what I really like um, about the, the beauty of this, of the game is that the, the, the friendships and the relationships that, that we have, they're relationships for life. Agreed. Agreed. And I feel like uh, we don't have to talk to each other every day or whatever the case is, Mm -hmm. But, you know, like if we ever needed each other, really needed right. each other, I feel like we would be there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And that's what that's why I say we're, we're family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because if we really need somebody, we know that that's you know, a phone call away. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I would definitely agree with you on that air. You know, now we got one more question for you um, oh, for, for the show that we ask everybody. You know, at one point of your career or, you know, or, or life, you know, we all go through low points. Um, now, my question for you is, how did you get out of your low point of your career or life? Did you go to God? Did you go to your family? Did you just, you know, get through it yourself? How did you deal with it? So my low point was when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I went from, you know, making 15K a month, mm -hmm. um, you know, to not making anything and trying to figure out what was, you know, going on with, with my body, mm -hmm. you know, and it was something that was completely out of my, out of my control. So I didn't play for almost about two years, mm -hmm. um, you know, just trying to figure out what was going on, figuring out what type of Crohn's I had, um, trying to figure out what I need to do in terms of, you know, is it medication? Is it diet? Is it a combination of both? So going through all of that, that was rough. Um, and it was rough on my support system. You know, my support system were, was my parents mm -hmm. and uh, my brothers and their families. And at the time, my, my brothers, their, their kids were really little. I mean, they were, you know, one, two and three years old. Right. right so, right. you know, the kids really didn't know at the same time, as a support group, they really didn't know how to, you know, be able to really help me out. Yeah. You know, at that time, you know, we were doing a lot of research, you know, and it wasn't just the, the typical stuff of just going on Google and see, see what, you know, pops up on like web and D. So it was a lot of, you know, research. Um, you know, I've always had God in my life, you know, with that, you know, really, you know, just going into, um, you know, just more prayer with that. Um, and just do, you know, really just reaching out to a lot of people, you know, trying mm -hmm. to get answers. Um, and that's, that was the actual beauty of Instagram because I started, you know, reaching out to people who, you know, were tagging stuff with Crohn's and I just, you know, asked questions like, yo, okay, you got Crohn's. I don't know much about it. I'm diagnosed. You know, can you answer this question? So I went through, you know, a series for, for months of just reaching out to random people and uh, you know, I was able to meet you know, some really cool people, mm -hmm. um, you know, with that people who I still talk to regularly, you know, whether now, now it's just, you know, what's up, what's going on. Um, you know, if there's a different medication somebody's tried or, you know, they were on for a while, Hey, how did this work for you? You know, did it work out, did it not work out, but that's really how I was able to pull myself out of that low point. And then I had a couple guys who, you know, just in Atlanta who I played against and really didn't know them. Don't know how they got my phone number. Mm -hmm. You know, don't know who they reach out and just randomly, you know, call it, Hey, you know what? I just had a feeling just need to, you know, check on you, you know, you good, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, as, as men, you know, we got to check in on each other. Agree. You know, because agree you know, we, don't, we don't get enough of that, mm -hmm. you know, being able to reach out. And it was just, you know, a couple of the guys who I had competed against, you know, I had earned their respect and they just reached out. So that, that camaraderie, just help me, you know, be able to get out of that point along, you know, just with the journey of figuring out what was going on with my body. And then, uh, and really that's how I ended up going back to Australia, you know, to play. And that's how I got into the QBL. So okay. Okay. that was kind of my, you know, second chance. And I was just like, you know, I know I got a lot of smoke left. 
Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I just got to figure out this other thing first to be able to figure out how I got to manage it in order to you know have myself healthy to play. So, you know, you ride the ebbs and flows, you know, with stuff. Um, you know, and it's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, I just got through basically uh, a six month, about a six, seven month window where my Crohn's was out of control again. Mm-hmm. So I had had three procedures, you know, switch medications, all that type of stuff. My body was just completely out of sync. And it's just, you know, I just got to ride that wave, you know, right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I know what mm-hmm. it, but being eight years into the journey, nine years into the journey, it was completely different from what it was, you know, nine years ago where I just didn't know what was going on. Right. So, right. so now, you know, with the different feelings that I feel internally, it's like, okay, I know what's going on. I got to, you know, go ahead. Is this something that I need to, you know, to see my doctor or do I actually need to go and get cut? Mm-hmm. And these were situations where I needed need to go get cut. Oh, so wow. it was okay. like, yeah. So it's like, okay, you know what? I need to go ahead and figure this out. Okay. This is, you know, kind of the plan of attack. Doctor saying one thing, nah, uh, uh-uh, that ain't working because we need to look at this instead. So now, you know, I'm educated. I know what's going on. I know my body, and as athletes, we're already in tune with our bodies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it really just it makes things a little bit easier when you start feeling off. No, you no, know, definitely, so, definitely. But uh, but yeah, just prayer. You know, having the right support group. You know, having you know the right people who who get it. You know, who you you know because there's certain days where you're just like, yo, like, you know, I'm just off. You know, like, you know, and then, you know, my Crohn's is off. I'm effed up in the head. I'm just, you know, I'm feeling just all over the place. And it had nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I can go ahead and tell you because I trust you. <laughs> yeah, and that's the whole thing. And, and you know that, you know what? It ain't nothing personal. He's just having a rough day. Yeah, you know, no, I got and, you. And, 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 that's, and that's the difference as far as with being able to get out of those low points when people know that it's nothing that they're doing. And it's just, you know, that that point in time that you're just having to, you know, get through. And it's just rough. No, I imagine, I'm, uh, you know, I imagine. I remember, you know, like for me, it was re- retirement, you know, mm-hmm. like officially going through retirement. And I was mad. I was mad at the world. I was mad at myself. I was hell. I was even mad at God, to be honest. Right. You know, and just like, why, why, why kind of thing. And just mm-hmm. like, you know, it took me a little while to kind of right. get out of that funk. I'm right. like, why? And like, why am I retired? Why am you know, why am I this or that? You know, just right. trying to figure out, you know, like, okay, what is it that you want me to do now? Mm-hmm. Try to kind of turn over my career, turn over my, you know, everything right. as a as a person. Right. So, you know, because all I knew was basketball for whatever, 28 right. years. Yeah. And uh, now all of a sudden I gotta, okay, you're not that no more. Let's get to the next thing. Right. You right. Know? And that's so, and that's, you know, part of it is just figuring out what's going to be not not just the next move, but the right next move. Right. right, right. Because, you know, with, with basketball, there's so many lessons that we learn through hoops that can be applied to anything, whether it's family life, it's relationships, it's business, it's, you know, teaching. Everything we go through, we can, you know, use different things that we've experienced that will help us achieve more than what most people actually realize because people see us okay we're just dumb jocks we don't know anything you know and it's like you know what we went to school i actually had an interview with um uh uh, bank of america and the interviewer was actually wanting to argue with me because he's like well you played basketball what do you know about you know banking i'm like my degree's in finance (laughs) (laughs) i'm like i know stuff i'm like and yeah i hooped but there's a whole bunch of other stuff and I'm giving you examples of things that I've done. But he was adamant and I wanted to say to the guy, just like, did, did somebody, you know, throw you in a trash can in high school or something? <laughs> you know, did somebody tease you or hurt your feelings? But I'm not that person. But, you know, we, we get those stereotypes mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. when we go in, you know, to different you know, situations. And unfortunately, you know, as we know of men of color, some people just don't like us just because of how we look. Yeah, right, right, right. That makes yeah. sense. That makes and, and, that, sense. That's, and that's cool. You know, but that, that's, again, part of, part of the, the lessons that we learn hooping. Because I always tell people, the very last thing we say if somebody can hoop is, hey, it's the white guys, the black guys, the Mexican guys, the Asian guy. Ain't nobody saying anything. It's the guy who, who's getting buckets. Yo, you got to stop 
you know, 42. You know, you got to stop doing with the headband, do with the J's on, whatever. And it's like, and if it's all these other things, the very last thing we may say, the black guy with, with you know, whatever hair, or the, you know, the white guy with, you know, with this look, whatever. We don't see that, that color. You're right. You're right. 100% right. 100% you know, and, right. And, and that, that's what I'm saying by the beauty of athletics and sport, because it teaches us to look at people for more than just what the physical characteristics happen to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, but that but with that, you know, with learning those lessons, the transition is difficult because we've lived in different countries. Yeah, we, we've gone, we've gotten on planes and landed somewhere where we know nobody there. <laughs> You know, yeah. we don't even know who's coming to pick us up from the airport and they got a sign saying Travis Reed or Aaron Maxey, right? <laughs> and you hop in a car and we're taught, we're taught as children, don't get in cars with strangers. What do we do? We get in car, random cars with strangers, right? <laughs> Agree. I tell yeah. you, when I went to Bogota, the army, there was no police. The military right. was the police. Yeah. So like, you know, I remember when our first check stopped to get out, yeah, it was like in the middle of this road where there's nothing but dirt and dirt. Yeah, and like they passport, you know, like yeah, like they had the you know big old machine. Yeah, got the machine guns and the Uzis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just like, dude, this is insane. So we give up the passport. And, okay, okay, you know, but like I'm so nervous because they could just pop us and be like, right. throw us in the field right there, man. So right. it was, it'd be crazy. You were 100 right. You 100 right, Aaron. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, yeah. But thank you so much, man. No, I, appreciate I appreciate you. I appreciate you for coming on, man. I you know, appreciate you as a, a brother of mine, a brother in arms. Like I said, people, we've been on each other for almost 30 years now. Yeah. You know, so it's been a minute. Right. Um, you know, like I said, I appreciate you. No, I got, man. you know, mad respect and mad love for you. Um, shout out your, you know, your Instagram, everything. Tell everybody what yeah. you're going on, what you got going on right now. Yeah, so I mean, my Instagram, my my uh, go to page is Aaron Period Maxi. You know, I try to keep that updated um, with a lot of stuff. Also on uh, Twitter, it's just Aaron Maxi. You know, on there, um, you know, you can follow me as far as with what I'm doing in terms of playing, advocating with Crohn's disease. Um, you know, doing a, a big push for uh, the TBT at this point. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, that's that's where it's at, man. All right. Well, like I said, thank you, Aaron. All right. If you listen this far, uh, please like, share, subscribe. This will be up on YouTube as well. It's coming up too. So, you know, we do try to do some big things um, for the show. Last but not least, you know, we got, you know, uh, a little little partnership with the MLO. Oh, awesome. uh, You know, Basically, these are the 15s. You go to mloshoes.com. These are right. super sweet, <laughs> nice. super light. You know, for guys like Aaron, who's a runner, he will love these. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's the runner, like he, he's sprinter, you know, in basketball. Yeah, I, so, I get it in. <laughs> you know, definitely, definitely. So anyway, like I said, we appreciate you coming on, Aaron. And like I said, people will just be uh, like, share, subscribe. Follow me at Travis W. Reed on Instagram. That's R-E-E-D, Travis W. Reed, and as well as Facebook. I post all my social content and everything on there so you can find everything up on there. We appreciate it. We'll see you later. Peace. Let's go. Thank you for watching Believe. You can find more great content at Believe.com. That's B-L-E-A-V.com. Do you believe?